We sat in on part of a seminar at the Graduate School of Business at Columbia University. After all, it's older than the stock exchange. And we thought professors familiar with the language of the street might treat the market with detachment. Dean Courtney Brown and Professor Benjamin Graham were instructing future brokers and customers men. The explanation cannot be found in any mathematics, but it has to be found in investor psychology. You can have an extraordinary difference in the price level merely because not only speculators, but investors themselves are looking at the situation through rose-colored glasses rather than dark blue, dark blue glasses. It may well be true that the underlying psychology of the American people has not changed so much, and that what the American people have been waiting for for many years has been an excuse for going back to the speculative attitudes which used to characterize them from time to time. If history counts for anything, that uh, the stock market is much more likely than not to advance to a point where of real danger. Ben was this incredible teacher. I mean, he, he was a natural. And I've done some teaching later on. I've actually tried to pattern some of the methods I use after what Ben did. He, he drew us all in. And one sentence changed my life. Here, remember, I'm a philosopher by background. Ben Graham opened the course by saying, if you want to make money in Wall Street, you must have the proper psychological attitude. No one expresses it better than Spinoza, the philosopher. When he said that, I nearly jumped out of my course. What? I suddenly look up, and he said, and I remember exactly what he said. Spinoza said, you must look at things in the aspect of eternity. And that's what suddenly hooked me on Ben Graham. And I got very involved, found him fascinating, and that's the beginning of why I ended up on Wall Street. He was stimulating, he was talking about current things that he was doing. He couldn't get out of the classroom because uh, when he was there, all of these young Tyros would go up to him and they'd want to ask him about this, this stock. Not, not so much about uh, individual stock per se, but they wanted to just see if they were on the right track. He could take the most complex problem and reduce it down to simplistic terms in a way using four-letter words that anybody down on the lower echelon could understand. He, I usually met him the afternoon of the day he was going to give a lecture. So that he talked about that very day. That made him very popular. But most people talked about last year. And he talked about today the market was very good or very bad. The statement came out it was good or bad. And that made the, the audience much more interesting. He would actually ask me questions that I think he already knew the answer to. It was really the Socratic technique, um, where you ask a question that you might know the answer, but you want to get uh, the other person to think about it. We'd get on the subway and open up the book, and he'd mark it, look at this one and come let me know what you think about this, and this one and that one. And he, he was very frank and with people, you would tell them more than they tell him. He was exceedingly fast, a brilliant thinker. Everything was informal, but uh, while he had a tie and, and uh, he had a white jacket on, I think that was to absorb the chalk. It was his working uniform. He, he was a practitioner and he was using current examples. I mean, here was the it was, like, it was like learning baseball from a fellow who was batting 400. <laughs> sometimes we, we wouldn't know where he was going sometimes. <laughs> and then it was kind of like an O. Henry story. There was always a surprise at the end. One time he uh, demonstrated that Company A was, looked cheaper than Company B until after about an hour he told the students they were the same company. After class you could go. He was always accessible and pleasant. He was very nice to students, very warm and very understanding. He was a Renaissance man. He was as interested in Latin and Greek as in, frankly, as in the stock market. Oh, I'll give you the other quote, the famous quote that ended in book. He used it in the class. Through chances various through all the vicissitudes we make our way. That's Horace. 
Oh, yeah, he very much, if you listen to Graham or talk to him, these things came in. One day I was uh, taking Latin in high school, and I mentioned to him that uh, I was studying uh, Cicero's oration against Catiline. And he said, oh yes, I remember that. Whereupon he quoted in memory, and of course in Latin, the entire oration. Uh, I just looked that up in the internet, it's 3,200 words. Well, I was used to being impressed, of course, by my dad, but that, that, that really did uh, blow me away. Well, it changed my life. Uh, if, if, if I hadn't read that book in 19, late 1949, uh, I, I'd have had a different future. Uh, it, 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 it instantly clicked with me that what he was saying made sense. Uh, and then the chance to uh, study under him and, and under Dave Dodd, too. It, it was a different experience, but it was hugely helpful. Uh, it really, it, it shaped my professional life. It was a powerful influence on me immediately, uh, which later even philosophy, to be an empiricist and to look at the data and not be influenced by what you heard around you. And, uh, uh, oh, that was very clear. Just be interested in fundamentals and forget all the rest and have patience. It was a failure to start with. It's hard to believe that the book could be so overlooked, but nobody cared. He, he would tell most people don't buy it stock. It was too early for the time. Ben Graham's family lost a great deal of their money in the Depression. So the whole fact was, the, the, whole, the whole concept was preservation of capital. Only he believed in cash, in cash. He did, did not like the companies that had a lot of bonds. Ben uh, was always thinking, by the time at least I knew him, as a passive investor, that, that uh, you bought a little of everything. So he had, was widely diversified, which is not a style that I would uh, go for. And, and he really, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't driven uh, toward maximizing performance. I think he talked about risk based on the fact that he wanted to buy something at uh, less than 50 cents on the dollar. He just wanted to buy something that was undervalued. Now, everyone I know that followed Ben had one thing in common, they almost never lost money because we were taught to buy so cheap that no matter what happened, we were fine. He would put a little money in almost anything that, that I came up with. And uh, he was not looking at all for the great business, he was looking for he was looking for really medi mediocre to a little bit better than that businesses that were selling very very cheap, and it worked very well. Uh, but uh, and of course the irony is that that the shareholders of Graham Newman made their money out of uh, made more money out of Geico, which was then called Government Employees Insurance, which was the antithesis of the kind of company he normally. Uh, would invest in. I remember years ago they looked through the manuals and tear sheets. It's not that different from today. My dad and I years ago, for years, we'd go, we'd look through value line and we'd try to, uh, you know, we would look and try to find the stock that was the best value within each industry group. Ben did what Warren did, and not Ben himself necessarily, because I know Walter Schloss would comb uh, Moody's. They'd go through every stock from A to Z, which later Warren did. And, um, you know, and look at the balance sheets. He would never get excited about an idea, but he would never throw cold water on it either. I would get excited. And um, he always felt that we shouldn't go out and talk to managements about the business because he felt that his books uh, were out there for people all over the country who would not have that opportunity. So he felt we ought to achieve our results in a way similar to what somebody who read the book could achieve them, and, and that we might be cheating a little if we if we worked a lot harder than that. I, I would have loved to go out more and, and see management. So so it was it was almost like we were running the fund uh, as as a few people who had read the book and who did not have the opportunity even to go visit management. So it was, the place was a little more passive and slower than I might have liked. And uh, but I was you know I was well by that time I was 23 or 24. 
making money did not did not motivate him. I remember one time I was standing with him by the elevator. We were going, we were going down to eat at the cafeteria in the bottom of the Shannon building, and he said, "You still remember it?" He said, "Warren." He said, "He said don't don't worry too much about making money." He says, "It it, it won't change the way you, you you live." He says, "It'll change the way your wife lives." But <laughs> he said, "Our wives live differently." But he says, "Look at you and I are wearing the same clothes. We're going to eat the same cafeteria. So relax." <laughs> ben was very very generous. He'd go out to lunch with people. And he would quite often just recommend stocks to people. And my dad used to be a little bit upset sometimes because he'd come back to the office. <laughs> he'd come back to the office after he had lunch and the stock was already up a few points because the guy had right away bid it up. And in those days, some of these things were not that liquid. So if you told someone about the stock, you could, the stock would move up a few points. He gave of himself to the public. And that's, I would say, a very generous deed. I know that his partners couldn't have been very happy with him because he, he gave away the trade secrets of Graham, <laughs> Graham Newman at times. And uh, uh, he wanted uh, his students to, to learn. So he was very open. He, was a, uh, he always wanted to talk about and, and teach and that sort of thing. I was kind of a young rookie at the time, so I was a good subject for him. And so he was uh, very nice um, to invite me over to his apartment and to uh, discuss investing with him. He would do things for you. My, my, my first son was born when I was, in, when I was working for him, and we named him Howard Graham Buffett after my dad and, and after Ben. And Ben came over and Esty, his wife, and they had a, a movie projector, a camera, I mean, a fairly expensive type gift, and he would always be doing that for you. And he, didn't, he, and he didn't want anything in return. He actually, on his birthdays, he would give gifts to the people that attended the birthday party because he figured he was the happy one. <laughs> he is the odd man out. I think Ben represented a certain approach to investing. He was very much aware that he was, buy, that he was going against the tide. He was buying companies that were troubled. He was willing to buy something when nobody else wanted it. Uh, he believed that you could, uh, which he was, you, you could become an activist in Wall Street and, and benefit. Uh, these, a lot of companies were not uh, operating on all their cylinders uh, like they should. And you could push them into doing more, which would uh, in itself would benefit society, would provide for greater employment and all of the things. So in that respect, I, he, was, he was also an Adam Smith. He was innovative, there was a new approach. I don't think necessarily he realized what an impact he was making. He was a very modest man. Everything was experimental, everything was new, everything was exciting. He was a man of ideas. So for him, I don't think he, at the time, he had any idea how significant uh, the, the approach uh, would become. And I don't think he had any idea at the time that he was creating this amazing, just this amazing, tremendous impact on the world of finance. He, he said every day he wanted to do something, you know, foolish, something uh, uh, creative and something, something generous. And believe me, he did things generous every day. He, he did not need to be coming up to Columbia uh, on Thursday afternoons every, you know, for 20 or so students, you know, many of whom probably didn't really even appreciate what they were getting. But, but he did it for decades. And, and, and he expected absolutely nothing in return. I mean, that was, I saw that time after time in terms of what he did. He really treated, he, he wanted to treat other people better than, than he expected them to treat him. This question concerns the so-called Wall Street professional. Are Wall Street professionals usually more accurate in their near or long-term market trends, forecasts of stock market trends? If not, why not? Well, we've been following that uh, interesting question for a generation or more. And I must say frankly that our studies indicate that you have your choice between tossing coins and taking the consensus of expert opinion. <laughs> and the results are just about the same in each case. Your question as to why uh, they are not more dependable is a very good one and an interesting one. And my own explanation for that is this, that everybody in Wall Street is so smart see, that their brilliance offsets each other. <laughs> 
and that whatever they know is already reflected in the level of stock prices pretty much and consequently what happens in the future represents what they don't know.